Well, um, good morning, everybody, and again, um, welcome to um, the Majolica Worldview Symposium. Um, for those of you who weren't here last night, and for those of you actually wa uh, watching live stream um, across the world, um, you will have an opportunity later to tweet questions um, at our general discussion uh, period at the end of the morning um, on our um, hashtag uh, Bard's Grad Center TV. Um, so we will be happy to receive virtual questions, as well, of course, of, I hope, many from our actual audience. Um, it's uh, really, I'd just like to reiterate uh, our thanks, institutional thanks, to um, the Majolica International Society for making this uh, symposium possible. I'd also like to thank uh, Susan Weber and the organizing committee, Lynn Thompson and her colleagues, um, for putting the program um, together so effectively, and of course to our speakers for um, making the journey. Um, thanks are also due to um, our academic programs uh, department, Eleanor Pinto-Simon, our Dean of uh, Student Affairs, and uh, especially Dr. Marc LeBlanc, who has been uh, wonderful in coordinating and arranging all the travel arrangements and indeed the arrangements for the smooth running of today. So thank you uh, to all, the, all everybody involved and of course our wonderful tech team as well. Um, we've just a few points about the order of today. We tried to order the um, program such that we Last night we began with Minton, and uh, we've tried to make the program flow out, as it were, from that source. So this morning we'll be hearing uh, more about uh, Minton and particularly the V&A uh, and, and the connections there with the Kensington Museum, uh, leading on to Italian, antiquarian myolica, and then considerations of policy. So the morning will be spent, I think, looking at these antiquarian and collecting uh, issues around uh, Majolica. And then, of course, the afternoon we spread out to, uh, in a sense, the rest of the world. Um, we'll reserve questions. Each speaker will speak for about 25 minutes, half an hour, and there'll be a coffee break uh, mid-morning, and we'll reserve questions um, until the end of each session, um, and we'll ask the speakers to come and talk. And that way, I hope we can stimulate discussion um, and find connections and interconnections between the, the talks and um, generate, uh, I hope, a lively debate about, as Susan says, uh, an understudied and under-researched topic. So without further ado, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome our first speaker, Rebecca Wallace, is curator of Western 19th century ceramics and glass at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, she has degrees in fine art, history of art and architecture, and European history from Reading and London universities, respectively and has worked at a number of museums, uh, including the Wordsworth Trust, um, the British Museum, and the Wallace Collection, before taking up her position at the V&A. And she's public published and lectured quite widely on Sir Richard Wallace's collections, on 19th century historicism, the Minson factories, and uh, recently uh, contributed to a catalogue on gold boxes and objets of virtu. Um, her current research interests include the architectural fabric of the v &A, including Majolica, and I'm sure we'll hear about this this morning, um, printed ceramics and 19th century European glass. Um, Rebecca is a committee member of the Decorative Arts Society in the UK and of the Glass Association of the UK as well. And the title of her talk today is Majolica in the South Kensington Museum. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Wallace. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and I'd like again to thank the Bard Graduate Centre and the Majolica International Society for putting on such a fabulous um, symposium on a subject that's dear to my heart and a particular area of research um, that I've been looking into recently. So it's a great privilege to be here to present on that today. The paper I'm giving today, Majolica and the South Kensington Museum, or as we know it today, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the V&A, the museum collected Majolica from the very beginnings of production in the mid-19th century, and the establishment of the museum in South Kensington was intrinsically linked to the Great Exhibition of 1851, which was staged nearby, and at which Minton launched these colourful lead-glazed earthenwares, and later supplying decorative tiles for the interiors of the museum galleries and refreshment rooms. 
Much of the majolica was bought for the museum around the time of production and direct from the various manufacturers and often at international exhibitions. So I hope this paper today will outline the breadth and quality of the V&A's majolica collections and the monumental interiors. However, it will also examine the curatorial taste for majolica during and since the 19th century and highlight, unfortunately, pieces that no longer exist in the museum's collection. So the formation of the, of the majolica in the, the, v &O, the South Kensington Museum is really thanks to three key players. And I show you here a portrait of Sir Henry Cole, the first director of the South Kensington Museum. And on the right-hand side, um, a sketch by Cole himself. I do apologize for the quality. I had to scan it from a publication um, of Herbert Minton and Leon Arnoux on a train journey together with Cole to Vienna um, in 1851. And Cole um, and Herbert Minton were great friends from when they first met in 1842. And in Cole's diary, he notes, in the evening came Minton of the Potteries to a, a dinner party that he, they both happened to be at. They were great enthusiasts and energetic, industrious men and had a passion for good design and quality production and really wanted to look at different ways of um, showing and showcasing good quality design to the public but also to educate and to train the the artists and the manufacturers and the artisans of the day. As I say, Sir Henry Cole was the first um, director of the South Kensington Museum and he was also, he started off as a civil servant and had a personal interest in inventing and in, in, in arts as well. And just, um, Lynn Arnaud, who I show here as well, was, as Andrew mentioned yesterday, was um, in heavily involved in inventing the majolica glazes that we know and love today. So their relationship starts at this formative period when the founding um, establishment uh, of the, what we know today as the Victoria and Albert Museum, South Kensington Museum, was coming into effect. And it's no surprise that the collections I'm going to talk about today are heavily Minton. And in fact, the vast majority of the around 80 pieces of majolica that we still have in the collection are Minton majolica. And it is thanks to these three men. Before we get to the 1851 exhibition, though, I want to talk about a brief period, which again, Andrew mentioned last night, which was a period of experimentation by Henry Cole, Felix Summerlee's art manufacturers. There was a competition <coughs> Um, in 1845 at the Society of Arts to of a prize for the designs for a tea service and Henry Cole entered under the pseudonym, pseudonym Felix Summerlee and produced a design for a teapot that was executed by Minton and he very much believed in the idea of form and function and the decoration being appropriate to the function of the object and what I'm showing you here is a, a slightly later production, Summerlee production <coughs> of the hop jug in the majolica glazes from 1858 and we actually bought it at the same time for the museums. I should mention that at any of the objects that I show here today, I've listed the purchase prices or the gifts and donations because I thought particularly for the collectors in the room, you can see how the prices have changed. So here, one pound four shillings, I think that's a bargain. Um, we, so we bought that around the time of production. <laughs> But also, we've very recently acquired, um, thanks to a bequest from um, a former curator in the V&A, Barbara Morris, this wonderful Parian example, which is from the time of um, some, some of these art manufacturers, which was a very brief period from 1847 to 49. And you can see how that transition in the Victorian period of taking the earlier Parian or even porcelain models and then putting the majolica glazes on top rather than creating a completely new model models for Majolica and I just think that's wonderful to have those two pieces together in the museum today. So Felix Summerlee's manufacturers did uh, wane in 1849 and that's because Henry Cole was one of the main um, 
um, directors and involvement with the um, Great Exhibition of 1851 and, and just had to concentrate on putting together, staging this fantastic event. Over six million visitors to the Great Exhibition of 1851. We're talking of a period of m mass tourism, transport, Thomas Cook establishing trips for um, people to, to, to visit the exhibition. It really became the event of that year. Um, however, in terms of British manufacturers, it was rather a failure. And indeed, because they decided to put themselves up against the international audience, it was noted that the British manufacturers didn't quite sit um, uh, didn't stand up to the, the quality of designs of, say, the French or um, the Italian manufacturers that were exhibiting there. And it was really a crisis point um, for the British government. And, and Andrew was talking yesterday about the schools of art and instruction that were set up around this time. In fact, Minton & Co. made a substantial contribution to the funding of the exhibition and presented their Majolica, as I say, for the first time. And they were the only British ceramic manufacturer to be awarded the Council Medal by the Great Exhibition Jury. So this crisis point for the arts in Britain led to um, the enlisting of, of um, Henry Cole and the founding of the museum, growing out of the schools of arts, originally at Somerset House, then they had a museum of manufacturers attached to Somerset House, uh, associated with Somerset House, that was then shown at Marlborough House um, until 1857, when the museum opened in South Kensington. And it was thanks to the funding on the back of the Great Exhibition, the development of the land around the Great Exhibition site in South Kensington, and very much the um, promotion by Prince Albert. And indeed, that area was known as Albertopolis for a very long time. So the first acquisition in the South Kensington Museum of Majolica was this small taxa or kylix. And I've, this unfortunately is in store at the moment and it's unmarked, but we have the documentation to show it came from Minton's, given by the company. Um, and you can see here, I've, I've shown the inventory of the blue enameled earthenware in imitation of, my, of myolica. Um, and I just think that's quite wonderful that this quite um, understated, beautiful piece is the first thing that we have in the collection and clearly showing those turquoise blues that Minton became so famous for. I'm going to put it on display. It needs no longer to languish in the stores. <laughs> <laughs> We also had, um, have a couple of tiles in the collection. They were actually transferred from the Museum of Practical Geology um, in 1901, which was another museum on, in Albertopolis that um, uh, we um, took over. And uh, these are two of the four tiles that we have designed by Pugin for the stove by Hardman's, which you can see an image of here, which was dismantled after the Great Exhibition. But we fortunately have two of the tiles, and I know there are a number in private collections as well. We also have this wonderful wine cooler and cover. Now, this, I can't say, was exhibited at the A Great Exhibition. Indeed, we bought it in 1861, and a number of versions exist. But I just wanted to show it next to the um, Industry of All Nations um, uh, illustration on the right-hand side. It was incredibly popular at the time, and indeed, Queen Victoria was so taken by Minton's palacey wares, as they were known at the time. And you can see clearly here the darker brown colours, the, the use of the natural form and the animals shown in relief, and, on the, and particularly appropriate ornament again, thinking back to the Felix Summerley approach with the, um, the, hop, uh, with the, with the wine um, leaves and the, even the, the figure at the top drinking out of the spout from the, the, uh, and picking the grapes from the top, top of the wine cooler. Queen Victoria was so taken by the palace he wears that she asked for pieces to be sent to Buckingham Palace and indeed gave her, allowed her name to be given to this wine cooler. So we continued to purchase items from um, great exhibitions. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Herbert Minton and uh, Henry Cole traveled greatly together and to, they looked at a number of collections, exhibitions, and here we have a, a <laughs> record of their visits to the great uh, Paris Exposition Universelle in 1855, photographed by the museum photographer. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side, um, Minton, Majolica 
type productions, including this amazing wine cooler by Thomas Kirkby, which we have in the v &A. And on the right-hand side, a prize-giving um, display from the end of the exposition. I have show this, if you look towards the back of the picture, there's a central dish, um, which is a Minton dish, again by D Thomas Kirkby. And here you see it on the right-hand side of the slide, which is a wonderful platter, very much taking influence from um, Maiolica, Renaissance Italian wares. Number of different sources here being used, though. As you can see, the border design is very much more of an invention um, of decorative styles. The centre portrait of Queen Victoria, but again, very much in the Renaissance portrait style on Maiolica. And then on the left-hand side, the, the accompanying piece, which is of um, Princess Eugenie, Empress Eugenie. These were both bought um, at the exposition in 1855 for £60. Pounds. Unfortunately, in 1934, or I, I shall not say unfortunately, it's appropriate. The Prince Empress Eugenie example was given to the Royal Collection. The curators at the time decided not to keep it in the museum, but I'm actually very happy that it's now displayed at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. Should you ever wish to visit, you can see it there. Um, so we, had, we bought these, this pair, and we think probably made for the visit of Queen Victoria, her first visit to France in 1855, and she visited in August. But it's a rather complicated story, because I show you here three dishes side by side, the Victoria dish. In the center, we have a dish by, um, commissioned by Giovanni Freppa, a Florentine dealer, in 18, around 1855, probably from Ginori in Florence, we think. And then on the right-hand side, a Sienese Maiolica dish, which is today in the V&A, but we didn't acquire until 1931, and it's earlier provenance. We don't have the details. But look at the border design, the centre of Queen Victoria, around the, the Barbarossa in the centre, and on the right-hand side on the Sienese dish. They are the same. They must have either seen an illustration, both Minton's and the Frepper example, or did they see the actual dish? Or indeed, were they copying each other at the, fact, at the exhibition? We just don't know. But it's a wonderful example of how not only are they copying historical sources, but possibly each other. The 1855 exposition was um, quite a moment for British um, majolic production. And uh, in that year, Sir Henry Cole is quoted as saying, Minton's trade has become very large in Majolica ware. English earthenware was smuggled into Paris at the time of the exhibition as cotton goods. Everyone from the top to the bottom of society became so hungry for this Majolica and palace ware. And it's just fascinating to think of the taste, the export taste, not just in Britain, but continuing across Europe for this um, material. In France, from 1846 onwards, um, Serve develops a faience workshop, and by 1855, they are producing wares in Majolica glazes. And I show you this absolutely amazing taxa. It's about a meter high. Um, it forms. It would have formed part of a table centerpiece. And I show you the illustration from the um, Tamara Preod's entry in the catalogue of the exhibition that was here actually at the Bard Graduate Centre on the, on the Bronya period of um, Serve production because the model was designed in 1836 by Chenevar um, in porcelain and then they've used the same model in 1855 with the Majolica glazes. It was um, described at the time um, in the 1830s, before it even reached the Majolica stage, so where the colours and the forms are even more accentuated by the, the coloured glazes, as being conceived in the slaughterhouse and executed in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is just wonderful. Um, it is a fabulous piece, and I think it really shows um, that taste for Majolica and how other factories were also looking to consumer taste and also the designs of the day. And indeed, Colin Minton Campbell, the nephew of Herbert Minton, said um, in 1855-56 that he was, when visiting the factory at Sev, he saw that they'd copied Minton vases and said it was their new production, but they were exact copies of their vases. 
And I should say the French-British connection at this period incredibly so strong. Obviously, Léon Arnaud, um, head, head artistic director at Minton. We also have um, Carrier Villers, an artist working both at the Stoke School of Art, producing um, designs for um, Minton's and other factories, and then goes on to be an artistic director at Sèvres. We have uh, Marc-Louis Solon, again, working across. And the factories themselves were keeping an eye on each other, no less so than businesses do today. And in fact, in the Solon archive in, the pot in Stoke-on-Trent, there are copies of Sev, um, um, Sev production catalogues, merchandise catalogues, Ginori production. Um, they were all exchanging information. And indeed, I believe that Sev at one point took on the designs of Anu for the, the kilns. The, his revolutionary kiln design. So there was a greater exchange rather than industrial espionage going on. So Cole and um, Minton and Arnoux also uh, worked together on acquiring the Soulage collection, which we have in the V&A. And we bought the entire um, collection between 1856 and 1860 in installments of £11,000. In fact, Minton contributed £1,000 of, of the money. Um, it was a collection by, of Georges Soulage, a Parisian uh, lawyer of Renaissance decorative arts. And in fact, Arnoux showed pictures of the collection to Cole during their 1855 um, visit to the exhibition. And I show you here um, the palissy ewer that we have from the Soulage collection on the right-hand side. And it was certainly in Minton's interest to have these collections in the public domain because they could reference them and create pieces uh, in homage to the original. And the public would know perhaps exactly what they were creating. But on the left-hand side, the ewer and basin created by Minton, I think to me is a very Victorian aesthetic of improve improvement where they really look to progress the glazes, the clarity of the colour, the clarity of the detail of the moulding. And indeed, during that period, they are looking to improve on perhaps what has gone before <laughs> and provide an alternative version of historical wares. And we display these side by side in the V&A today, and I just think it's a wonderful combination. So I know some of you have seen this vase before, but it is a showstopper. Um, <coughs> And the Prometheus, or captive vase as it's known, was acquired from the 1867 Paris Exposition um, and modelled by Victor Simeon, a French sculptor who moved to Britain, um, founding in his own workshop and designed for the pottery industry. And the painter, indeed, was Thomas Allen. And I show you here the print by um, Kessel that's in the British Museum. And it's most likely it would have been from a print source that they would have used to um, inform the decoration on the vase, not being able to see the painting, perhaps, itself. Um, and I just think, as, as um, Andrew was saying yesterday, that the, the translation from the original sources to the vase is absolutely stunning. The other vase we bought, we bought a pair, um, is decorated with the Rape of the Sabines, and that's unfortunately in store um, at the moment because at one point in its history in the museum, the, the top was slightly damaged, but we may want to put it on display again if we can get it conserved. <coughs> the, so the pieces I've shown you so far, are very, it's very heavily mint in the collection. Um, not just because of the connection with Herbert Minton, but also by 1878, 20, nearly 30 years after the, the Great Exhibition, still in Britain, Minton is considered the best at producing majolica, and I do think that informed the curator's taste. The art journal of that year said, in majolica, no manufacturer ha has surpassed them in the sharpness of details, purity of colour, and excellence of glaze. So, it's often something to consider. However, we did acquire European Majolica, and I wanted to show you two examples of palissy style that we have, this beautiful dish by Georges Poul, which was donated by him in 1869, and that's just a wonderful reference we have to show how 
how important the museum collections were being considered at that time. And on the right-hand side, a piece um, by Manuel Mafra, which I'll, my colleague Christina Hotel will talk more about Mafra later in the day. But this was lent to us from around 1871, after the exhibition that year in London. And again, it's just a wonderful <coughs> example with the swirling snake handles and then across the body and the, the relief detail here. And again, lovely early acquisitions for the museum. We also collected um, northern European examples, and I know Dr. Weber will be talking about Rostrand um, pieces later, the factory later on. I wanted to show this example because it was given by Robert Alstrom, who was Rostrand's technical director, and this was given to the museum in 1877, this very neo-Renaissance um, vase and cover. And on the left-hand side by uh, Bigweiler, the uh, designer and architect who established a workshop um, in 1878 in Hamburg, um, and Karl Paul Bonner, an architect, was employed as one of the principal artists. And within a few years, the company was awarded prizes at Melbourne, Frankfurt, and the Hamburg exhibitions. And this is a wonderful example of the neo-Gothic design we have here. But we don't just have objects in the collection. We also have the interiors. And I show you here the... Um, absolutely wonderful um, refreshment rooms that thankfully we still have in the museum now more on that and on but you can see that the the decoration is clearly in the della robbia majolica style the columns this is where it gets complicated often these rooms by those who aren't necessarily looking specifically at ceramics it gets termed oh it's the minton rooms they're not all by the same company, and it's through delving through the archives and looking at the inventory and purchase list that we've been able to work out that the columns are um, by Minton Hollins and Co., the wall tiles by Minton and Co., and then the overdoor decoration by uh, Moore and Co. Now that you might think, well, why does that matter? Well, actually, the period in around 18, the late 1860s, when this um, decoration was in being installed was a time of great separation for Minton's. Minton Hollins and Co. separated from Minton and Co. And indeed there were um, notes in advertising in the press from Minton Hollins and Co. very much stating we are a separate company but we are still producing the tiles. We are the best company at producing the tiles. And so it was a great rift between Colin Minton Campbell and, and Dantry Hollins at that period. And so it's something to be aware of if you're researching Minton from around 1867 to the early 70s because the, it is a confusing factory history. <laughs> the refreshment room itself, um, as I say, took a, num took a number of years to complete and indeed the standard quoted in 1869, it's a dining room which year by year never seems to approach completion. <laughs> so <laughs> obviously still working on it. Um, the designs are by Godfrey Sykes and James Gamble and there's a frieze around the entire room which um, a biblical um, quote, there is nothing better for a man than he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy in his good labour, which is absolutely wonderful. It's part of a great building project from about 1863 onwards, the museum needed a more substantial building in place and that included the refreshment rooms, the lecture theatre and the whole back of the museum as it stands today, the other side of the courtyard, is that first phase of building. And very much it was done, the decoration was done in association with the schools of art, which by this stage were also on site. Um, today we know them as the, the, the Royal College of Art, which is now relocated just down the road, um, the other side of the Albert Hall, but originally they were on site with us. And so we were able to, they were able to use the students' skills and developing their experience, working alongside the tutors like James Gamble, Godfrey Sykes, and F.W. Moody to design these rooms, to create the models, and then send them to Minton's to be made up in Stoke-on-Trent. And so it was a great collaborative period. This is a wonderful shot of the ceramic staircase that was created, which leads off from the refreshment rooms. And I wanted to point out, um, if I can just use the... You can see here S and A in, in the frieze. So F.W. Moody moulding these with the students from the science, schools of science and art. 
the separation of science from the museum really didn't happen until the end of the 19th century, and that's when the formation of the Science Museum in South Kensington was created. And it was really part of Henry Cole's vision to look at arts, manufacturers, science and techniques and industry all as one, a very, um, very much training the, the workers in the industry. And there's a wonderful example of the modelling and the sculptural forms on the staircase here. Again, all of these were moulded, then sent up to um, Stoke-on-Trent. And I show you here what was, sorry, more bad news, what was the ceramics gallery in 1876. This print was um, made, but it was actually completed in 1869. The, the whole decoration was um, done again by Moody and Gamble, along with the students. Um, and you can see here the columns that were decorated in Majolica and the, it was the specific galleries for ceramics until the end of the 19th century, where today the ceramics are in dedicated spaces at the top of the museum. Um, so the collection obviously grew, because these are now, as if you visit the museum, the silver galleries, and it's a much smaller space. But we have still got the decoration at the top, and I don't know if you can just make out the various centres of ceramic production which are listed on the frieze. This is all painted decoration, and then the columns are all relief majolica, with um, decoration around the central forms. There were 10 columns, and the decoration around the centre forms um, included names of well-known ceramicists, such as Della Robbia, Zanto, and Josiah Wedgwood. Now, when we talk about Majolica um, and its importance in the collections of the museum, I think the next slide will really show you they were key in the 19th century. They weren't just add-ons, they were at the centre of the collections. So this is the ceramics gallery of the South Kensington Museum. Look how much Majolica was in the centre of the displays. So we have the Prometheus vase on the left-hand side. Note the, um, the vase and stand here, I'll come to that shortly. Obviously the columns, and then these wonderful garden seats that were again designed by James Gamble, and we have a pair of those. Again, I would like to put them out in the galleries at some point. Unfortunately, they're in store at the moment, so hence the rather awful historic image I have of them there. But I really wanted to point out how important they were, and they were prized um, to be put in this, because this is the centre of the gallery. However, the taste of Majolica changed, um, and it was considered admirable work by some at the time, but the decoration in this room was also considered a sham art, just as they are sham columns, a casing of crockery built up around a brick core, said the Building News in 1870. Majolica was shown in the key displays, I say, till the tw end of the, till the 20th century, and much, many of the pieces I show you were actually sent to Bethnal Green, to the Museum of Childhood as we know it today, it often seen as the way, by the curators then, I should add, as the place to put things out of sight. Um, and then this decor was actually removed in 1914. The then director, Sir Cecil Harcourt Smith, really detested Majolica decoration. There was a protest in the Times. Henry Cole's son, Alan Cole, was involved in, in asking for the pieces to, to remain in, in situ. However, they failed, and the floors were ripped up, and the columns ripped out, and we managed to reinstate two of the columns from, from fragments and from reconstruction when we reopened the silver galleries in 1996. However, we can't put the whole thing back. Fortunately, the staircase and the refreshment rooms remain, mainly because they were boarded up for most of the 20th century. So, But without further ado, I move on to the major I, um, piece of Majolica, which we did own. It was accessioned by the museum. I give you the inventory number here. In 1863, it was given by Mintons to the South Kensington Museum. The George and the Dragon Fountain of 1862 of the London Exhibition. Um, and it was, what a, an amazing piece. If there were no other object in the building, this grand work alone, but this grand work alone, it would be well worth the shilling entrance to see it, said the news of the time. Well, indeed. And you can imagine with all the various component parts and the George and the Dragon atop 
by the fountains perfumed by Rimmel. Remember, it's a sensory experience. It was given to the museum, as I say, in 1862. From until 1872, it was in the horticultural gardens um, near to the museum. Then it was moved to the Bethnal Green Museum of Childhood, um, where it, uh, you can see a print of it here on the right-hand side at the opening of the exhibition um, of Sir Richard Wallace's work uh, collection, actually, in 1872. However, as I say, taste change. So from 1914 mm -hmm. to 1926, this is the period where the decisions were made on what to do with this fountain. By then, the frost had got to it, the dirt, the pollution had got to it. It was outside, obviously, it was exposed to the elements. A storm in 1914 blew the top off. So this is why I show you the picture here. And there was a debate internally about what to do with it. Curatorial taste had moved on. I'm not going to lie. I show you here some archive material which shows comments about what they were considering. So coming up to the First World War, the decisions were put on hold. However, the best um, course of, is to let the fountain quietly decay. There is always a chance that a bomb might hit it. <laughs> Queen Mary doesn't help, unlike her mother-in-law. She dis describes it as that hideous thing has been, that hideous thing, has it been taken away, has it not? Really wasn't helping. The local community in Bethnal Green seemed to adore it. They wanted it. It was part of their, um, their, their, cultural, their social landscape. But the museum just decided it had to go. And indeed, there was a part solution. The... Parts suitable for preservation were transferred to Bethnal Green, and I've been to the archives. I found the logbook, the handwritten notes, to say that the council has selected pieces to go to Bethnal Green. We have a note in our archives listing the date when they left the museum. However, the remainder of the fountain, I've been told, is, was possibly crushed, broken up, and used as a foundation as the road was extended outside the museum. Also, there's a flower bed over it, so maybe archaeological investigation, we may be able to find some underneath. The parts that were suitable for preservation, could they have been the types of fountains that you see here? Possibly. I mean, this is a later edition, 1874, but Minton's continued to produce them. So who knows? If anyone has an 1862 dated stalk fountain in their collection, please let me know. Other transfers, and Andrew showed images from the Stoke-on-Trent collection. Um, much of the Majolica came from the <coughs> South Kensington Museum in 1934. The curators deaccessioned, transferred it, thankfully, to another museum. The Gottfried Semper vase with snake candles here, the um, vase and stand I showed you earlier, and that wonderful flower vase from the 1855 exposition on the right-hand side. But the taste was changing. I've also found, um, I am aware of time, just a few minutes left, I also found um, in our archives a reference to a monkey garden seat um, described as Naples earthenware, 18th century, supporting a cushion and painted diaper pattern in polychrome. It was bought in 1855 as Italian. At that point, they thought it was 17th century. Deaccessioned and sold in 1951. I have no image of it. Could it be contemporary Italian? Of course, Gennori were making garden seats, but they don't have the cushions. Or could it be the precursor to the Minton model? I just don't know. So that's my monkey puzzle. <laughs> we did have a revival of interest, though. And from, uh, for the thanks to curators such as Barbara Morris, Jennifer Opie, and Paul Atterbury, a real revival of interest in um, Minton Majolica, and indeed anything Victorian um, came about from the 1960s onwards. And we had this monumental exhibition in 1976, and I show you here a press cutting, which is in the refreshment rooms, and the Thomas Good elephants were lent. You can see the flower um, stand behind from the Potteries Museum, and those of you can just make out in the back the peacock, which is also today in the Stoke-on-Trent um, Pottery's Museum and Art Gallery. And there was a great revival of interest in the interiors, and from this point onwards, we really started to preserve our interiors. We were also acquiring more Majolica. You see here 
three examples of tiles from a great collection we bought in 19, again 1976, um, to, to really fill the gaps that we had in our core collection. And we continue today. Just in 2004, we very generous gift from the 1010 Foundation in honour of David T. Segel of this wonderful Wedgwood vase. And I, we only had one other Wedgwood Majolica in the collection before this. And I just think it's a real stunner. The, uh, the, the glazes here are just wonderful. And I'm also continuing to acquire Majolica in, um, as a curator myself. And I have a wonderful um, donation coming from Jody, Judy Novak um, through the American Friends. And it comes full circle. What am I acquiring? The snake-handled vase by Gottfried Semper, the model of which we deaccessioned in 1934 when we thought we didn't need it for the museum. I think we need it. So it, it's an interesting turnabout. And I think this brings me to my conclusion. Majolica is a type of ceramic that often divides opinion. For one queen, they were considered marvellous technical creations and aesthetically beautiful, and yet to her daughter-in-law, a hideous thing. This has been the problem for Majolica within the V&A collections. Few other ceramic types have suffered such wildly different periods of triumph and decline. In the 20th century, when deaccessioning was accepted by the museum, Curators' current tastes define what the collection continued to be. But to rely on taste to decide collections is, I think, a dangerous thing. Today, at the V&A, we do not deaccession works of art, therefore safeguarding contemporary ceramics against the changing tastes of tomorrow. For myself and my fellow curators, today Majolica is a core part of the V&A's founding collections and an intrin intrinsic to the fabric of the building as it was in the 19th century. Thank you.